you're building a startup, you're working on projects, you want to make your project compatible all around the world. And, you know, if it's on DC, you buy a universal adapter from some sort of reputable um, Chinese or Korean or Japanese supplier, primarily because very few of them are actually made in North America anymore, if any. But let's say you're talking AC, like I am with the Maelstrom controller. Things get a little tougher. For one thing, I mean, the simplest way is to buy, ta-da, a very, very expensive industrial um, AC power supply. I thought I had connections that might have one of these here. Um, turns out I don't. And I tried to beg, borrow, plea, try and get contacts to borrow one of these just for short-term testing. And I failed. I couldn't find anyone in the Calgary area that had one of these that was willing to let me borrow it for a few weeks to do all this testing. Mm. So I went about it the not quite the smartest way you can, but I'll say a, a semi cheap way. Um, realistically, this has only cost me a few hundred Canadian dollars. Not that big a deal. But it is kind of the Rube Goldberg machine of volts. So if you're not familiar with the Rube Goldberg machine, stop now, look them up. There are some fun, amazing ones on YouTube. This is only fun and entertaining because at some point you're just laughing at how ridiculous the voltage conversions continue to be. So normally a Rube Goldberg machine will accomplish a very simple task through something very complicated and not necessary. Uh, the old 90s tabletop board game called Mousetrap was kind of actually just a Rube Goldberg machine. So that's kind of the entry point here. But what I've done is I'm just converting volts back and forth to AC to DC to AC to DC, pointlessly, almost. So let's kind of dive into what I did to test 50 hertz, 240 volts AC in a country that doesn't supply that voltage or frequency. How would we go about changing 110 volts to 220 or 240 volts? Well, the simplest way is to just use a step up transformer but that doesn't do anything about the frequency because the transformer will still be 60 hertz. So that doesn't really solve the problem that I'm after. What I'm really after is the 50 hertz aspect. And I tried generating 50 hertz in a couple of different ways. I actually got an audio amplifier I built, put a sine wave into a wave file, ran it out through the amplifier, and I was able to get good timings off of it, but I couldn't actually power anything. So in this case, what I'm actually able to do is actually power something. So we're starting at 110 volts 60 and running into a 12 volt adapter. Sounds simple enough, but there's a lot of conversions going on in there. The AC is first rectified to DC, uh, a high voltage DC and then it uses high frequency, it kind of PWMs it into a transformer to step it down. And the reason they do this is because, you know, if you grew up uh, early 90s, late 80s, you notice that you would get these really, really large transformers, but they were only good for a couple of hundred milliamps. And now for something similar in size, you get you know, uh, many amps. Um, I think something like a fraction the size, the, the adapters that come with uh, iPhones or Android phones doing five volts at like two, three, sometimes three and a half amps. Uh, they are a fraction the size and the weight, but they do a lot more power. And the reason they can do that is when you operate a transformer at a higher frequency, you get generally better efficiency, better efficiency than you can at 60 hertz without having a huge transformer. So 
you get to minimize the size of the transformer you need by switching faster. So AC to DC to high frequency AC, to, uh, which then goes through the transformer, generating high frequency, low voltage um, AC, and then you rectify that and adjust it through regulators and such. So there's about five conversions going on here. That gives us 12 volts out. And what can you do with 12 volts really? Well, sine wave inverters or inverters have been really common for the RV and just the automotive industry. People want to power their regular household devices while they're on the go and cars have normally been 20, uh, 12 volts. Some RVs have been 24. So get yourself a sine wave inverter. But you can't just go to Amazon and Canada and pick these up. Um, in the US, you sorta can, but in Canada, they don't have any 240 or 220 volt or any 50 hertz, anything anywhere. So you have to try and figure out ways of importing it. So I bought and imported a 240 volt, 50 hertz AC inverter. And it has, it's called pure sine wave. And the reason it's called that is because old inverters used to use triangle waves or square waves to try and sort of simulate AC. And when you have inductive loads or some things just don't really care if there's a transformer or there's an inductive load or if there's a rectifier, it doesn't really care. It's kind of good enough. But in this case, because of the track firing angle, we need like legit. Um, and it's a little harder to do that. So what they do is they take their DC and they chop it up into sort of what simulates AC. But they do it like an H bridge, kind of like the if uh, a DC motor. So you can electronically choose it to go forwards or reverse with essentially they use four FET. So you, you turn on your, your diagonals and that allows you to run it forwards or reverse. That's what they're doing here, but they're PWMing so that they can simulate a sine wave. That runs through a transformer and because of the inductance, it kind of smooths this all out. So you smooth this all out with a combination of inductance and capacitance, and you get a relatively pure sine wave. And that gets us to 240, 50 Hertz. And I don't have a fan that runs on 240. Okay, no worries about the fan. Well, lots of worry, lots of worries about the fan, but we can, we can figure this out. So I figured I would do something stupid after realizing that there's a much simpler solution to this problem. Um, the stupid way actually took two attempts. So the first attempt was, I've got a fan, it has two settings, high and low, and there's different resistance associated with that, but it's an inductive load and there is back EMF. So you kind of calculate your, your there's a, the forward voltage, then the back voltage, and then this little bit is what is kind of ending up in your resistive load. So the larger the back EMF matching up with the voltage, the more efficient your motor can be. So I'm thinking, great. What I need is, if I need 110 volts here, I need 110 volts across something else in series. So it's just a simple two resistors in series. Great. What's cheap and easy and accessible that can handle a lot of load? Because if, if this thing is taking say 30 or 40 Watts, I need something else to take 30 or 40 Watts. And as you can see here, I came up with light bulb. Light bulb, super common. Dollar stores still sell incandescent bulbs, you know, for those uh, hardcore incandescent fans. So first attempt here is in pink. Let's series up a light bulb with a fan. Plug it all in together. 
Power's up, 12 volts, light comes on. We're good to go, guys. Bew fault. Bew fault. Bew fault. So what, what's going on when I'm faulting out? Well, I did some simple calculations in my head, ignore this for, for a second, and I was like, well, I probably should have used a different one. Maybe it's wrong, um, but I wanted a higher resistance. Um, I probably would have, if I did this math differently, I would have chosen a lower wattage bulb actually. So I was just thinking, all right, here's a 100 watt bulb. 100 watts, 110 volts, approximately 0.91 amps. Do some V equals IR and 120 ohms. 120 ohms in series with, well, let's go with the low setting, means that the largest voltage drop is going to be across this. All right, Keith, we can figure this out. You get the industrially rated, still at a dollar store, can do up to like 150 volt bulb. All right, great. I mean, it doesn't have to last forever. Series it up. Whenever I try and start it, <clears throat> the sound of a discharging capacitor and a fault. This isn't good, but there, the light is blinking on for a second and the fan starts to go, but it doesn't go. So I tried to like cleverly get the fan going plug it in, turn everything on, and yeah, it was, but it, it, it only helps it a little bit. What's going on? Well, if you actually measure a 100 watt light bulb, it's not 120 ohms. It's like 20. And when you initially turn on an incandescent light bulb, everyone talks, I hadn't heard in years, but it was mentioned, the lights dim a little. Uh, other lights in the house. And I didn't realize it's because initially it draws 660 watts. Not only that, it's in series with something else at a higher voltage. So it's probably drawing a thousand watts. I only got a 300 watt continuous, 600 peak watt rated inverter. Can't power this at all. And I also realized I'm doing my math wrong. All right, so let's try and heat up the light bulb. bulb and then swap everything over and just, it's still too much. Let's just try two light bulbs in series. Maybe it's the inductive aspect of this load. Nope. Two light bulbs, flash, flash, flash. Ugh. All right. I've only got like what can do 60 watts continuously, maybe peak at 90 or 100 for a short instance in an adapter. Maybe that's my problem. Get a big, 29, I don't know why they couldn't just get to 30, 29 amp, 12 volt industrial style power supply common on 3D printers. I'm going to need that for another project anyway. So yeah, let's, let's just pick that up for $30. Great. Pew, pew. Nope, doesn't work. But I anticipated it's still not working. So, Instead of light bulbs, actual resistors. And I sized, I got, I got three different ones. I got a 220 ohm, a 470 ohm, and a 1000 ohm one. Um, with intention that the 220 or 470 one would go across here um, to replace the light bulb. And lo and behold, it works. And then I realized a 50 watt rated resistor is only 50 watts if you apparently attach its heatsink to another heatsink. So here's a bit of a short demo, but in order to keep the resistor cool, the resistor is actually in front of the fan. <laughs> All right, so this connects to the 12 volt power supply, to the pure sign inverter, which goes to my prototype Maelstrom, which goes out to this resistor. And yeah, that's still a little hot um, to the fan in series. So let's uh, plug it in first. Now let's get out the old multimeter so you can see it's 12 volts. Yep, 
And sure enough, 11.98, so close enough to 12 for a cheap multimeter. Let's fire on the sine wave inverter. See the flashing sequence, and we're receiving. So just so you can see the AC side. Two hundred and thirty one volts, so splitting the difference between two twenty two forty, I guess. So let's just leave that there for a second while I use the ant simulator. Let's turn it on the lowest setting so it doesn't kick in until twenty, so we'll set thirty watts. And now let's come back and we can measure some of the, the voltage. So output 140 volts. But keep in mind there's a voltage drop across this resistor. So if we measure that voltage drop, there's 83 volts. So it should be 60, 74 volts across the fan. So, increase this, so this default settings, uh, not default, is 200, so actually let's set it higher than that, 210, max it out, so 213.8. There's always a little bit of loss across these triacs with the firing angle, um, the way I've set it up in the code. 136 across the resistor, and that leaves just about just close to 100 volts across the fan, which is pretty close to what I was expecting anyway, but it's 50 hertz, so it's spinning a little slower this time. And that's it.